Hey guys, it's Kevin with Mix Coach. I'm really excited about uh, what we're going to be talking about today. One of my, well, my favorite subject is uh, mixing, and I'm going to be talking with Billy Decker. But first, I wanted to let you know um, some things that uh, that might help you that I have uh, before we get to talking to uh, Billy. I've got a workshop that's happening um, here pretty soon. You can find it at mixcoach.com forward slash workshop. It's a workshop where I'm going to be sharing my fa five favorite mixing tips. And I know that at least one, if not all of them are going to change your mind about mixing and kind of um, put your head in the right space for mixing. I know that mixing sometimes seems to be kind of a, a brain hack that you have to kind of get your mind around. And there's a workshop that I'm doing that is going to help you to do that. So go to mixcoach.com forward slash workshop. It's free and uh, I guarantee you're going to like it. Okay. So go to mixcoach.com forward slash workshop, and I will see you there. Okay. But for now, what we're going to do is I am going to be talking to Billy Decker. Billy uh, is just such a cool guy. Uh, I've been chatting with him here for just a few minutes here. Billy's been mixing for, uh, let's see, he went to Full Sail in 92 and 94. He moved to Nashville where he's been like mixing uh hundreds of songs a year, if not thousands. We'll, we'll clarify that a little bit, but he, he's been mixing uh, things like uh, stuff for Chris Young, Losing Sleep. Uh, he's mixed stuff for Kenny Chesney, Darius Rucker, Jason Aldean, Jamie Lynn Spears, and Sam Hunt. Um, a lot of what he's mixed has gone number one on Billboard. And uh, what's really cool about it is that a lot of what he's mixed or everything he's mixed, according to this book, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. This is uh, called Template Mixing and Mastering. And I have read it and it is a great book. And there's a lot of stuff in there that uh, I'm going to be tweaking up my template, my own personal template with some of the things that he recommends in the book. We're going to be talking about all that stuff. So anyway, without further ado, are you ready, Billy? Here we go. Here's Billy Decker. Uh, on the, on the, uh, as we speak. Sorry. <laughs> you said I had two minutes before we went live. So I squeezed another mix out. No, I'm <laughs> Are you kidding me? I am bouncing something down though. I had a recall to do real quick, <laughs> but I do have five to mix today. So, uh, oh, that's cool. We shall yeah. see. Oh, you have five, so you have another one since the last time we talked. You're just kind of like ringing yes. them up, right? Yeah, my phone actually dinged. Go, can you squeeze another one? And I'm like, sure. Come <laughs> okay. On. Come yeah, on. no problem. Uh, no, so Billy, you've just written this book with Simon Taylor uh, called. Uh, Template mixing and mastering. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave a uh, link in the uh, in the live chat section, and I will I will definitely uh, put it in the comments section too. But uh, let's see if you go to I just made one. Here we go. Uh, if you want to see the book, go to mixcoach.com forward slash Decker book. Um, it's available on Kindle and uh, paperback. It's it's a really good read. Promise you, it's worth. The price of admission. I would definitely check out the book. There's some really cool stuff that uh, s some of the stuff, Billy, I was just like uh, writing like a, like a madman uh, with some notes and things to get clarity on. But as the further I read in the book, the more clarity I got on the stuff. So, um, uh, so yeah, tell me, tell me about, uh, tell me about you, uh, your story before we, before we get into the book, tell me about your story moving into Nashville, getting busy uh, with mixing all that stuff. How did you fall into this crazy category of mixing? Uh, well, before I start, I got to say, when you said that word clarity, the only thing that's coming to my mind is my wife sucked me into watching The Bachelor with her. So they're always saying, clarity, take this journey with me. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mixing with Two Bachelors today. You know, <laughs> We're both happily married. We're both happy. <laughs> Did you bring the rose? or? <laughs> You want to take this journey with you? Here, here, here's this mouse. Take this mouse. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. All right. So, yeah, I ended up moving to Nashville in 94. Uh, my wife and I credit carded a move. We had no children then. And we were coming by way of Virginia Beach, by way of California, by way of Nebraska. So, <clears throat> uh, we arrived and... I was going to take the town by storm, and within one week, I was going to be mixing every record in town, and little did I know, the only thing I was mixing was dishes at Longhorn Steaks, <laughs> <laughs> wiping grease off everybody's plate, so did that, waited tables, uh, boy, I just, I interned again, and ended up getting hired on as a song plugger, 
And that led to working with some songwriters and that led to working with doing their demos. And that led to working with a studio and 25 years later, here we are, but boy, it was, it was a fun road for the first couple of years, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, that's Paying the dues, I guess is what they say, you know? And what's that? Paying your dues. I Paying guess. Paying your dues. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things, and just, just evidence from just being able to talk to you and sending a few texts here back and forth. I think there's a, you know, I think at least this is my story. Um, I think people will give you a license to be not uh, perfect if you're easy to hang out with, if you're conversational, if you've got things to talk about. If you're a cool, if you're a cool hang, that will that will get you a lot of mileage toward uh, paying your dues, right? I think so. <clears throat> I've had, I've actually had people tell me, and I've said this before, that clients will come in, they'll be like, "Decker, you're you're not the best, obviously, but." you're probably one of the nicest guys and your control room smells good. You burn incense. I'm actually burning incense right now. Look at that. It's always going over there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and your wife keeps you stocked up with good snacks. We'll be back. We like, yeah. hanging. we'll be back. Well, you know that you, since you flashed that over here, I'm going to jump in real quick here. Um, on one of the pages. Okay. On page 86 of this book here, you okay. show your trusty old boom box. That's yes. what you call it in the book. And, uh, and there's an award of some kind in the book on the left, but there was a pack of cookies on the right. What, what, what was, what kind of cookies were those? <laughs> those were Christie cookies. <laughs> Actually, Christie cookies, my favorite cookies. They're made here in Nashville. I have no affiliation with them. I would love a sponsorship, but I don't even know what that would mean. So uh, it, do, those, cookie do those help? Like, does it help you to get uh, the vocals up when you're chomping on, on cookies and trying to get the mix right? <laughs> no, it just, keeps me from like crashing without a sugar high. I drink so much yeah. coffee during the day. Well, <laughs> Hey there. Okay. So seriously, I'm going to jump in this time. There are so many good things in the book. Um, um, let me ask you, you, you use a template and it's pretty much kind of like locked down. And I think you probably, according to the book, you, you, you tweak it to, you know, you, you put everything in the template and you're pretty much there, but then you, you do a little bit more tweaking. But you mentioned that you do reference mixing, that you always reference, which is something that I, I believe in wholeheartedly. So a mixer to mixer, what I'd love to know from you is what, is, in your opinion, now this can't be one of your mixes, but what mix uh, that comes out of Nashville, country, a country mix, what is a great mix that you always reference? Uh, I go back and reference uh, Chris Lord Algae mixing uh, Tim McGraw. Uh, I got a barbecue stain on my white t-shirt. She yeah. anything from that genre I was in love with. Yeah. Uh, Mike Shipley dabbled in country for a bit too. And he's one of my favorite guys. Yeah. Uh, so probably I go back and listen to that stuff, which to me, that's still timeless. You know, yeah. I, I, I would love to be able to even come close to something like that. Yeah. And you and Chris Ordage have a lot in common. I noticed that you and he are in the book and you've got a picture maybe, which I'm a little jealous. When I lived in California, I went by his studio. I felt like such a, like a fan girl uh, on going by Chris Ordage studio. And I saw the name on the door, you know, what was it called? Mix, uh, mix LA or something like that. And then I went on to Ventura where I was going, but uh, he mixes really fast too. And, uh, he mixes uh, whether it, not in the traditional sense that we're talking about now, but he mixes with templates. He but he just has hardware Correct. that he leaves alone and never touches, and he runs things through it at a certain level. So some of my favorite mixers use those mix templates. I think Michael Brower probably uses mix templates. So I think a lot of people who getting to get into mixing are they think they have to reinvent the wheel all the time. And I'm just glad to hear of yet another mixer who is crushing it using uh, mixed templates and, uh, and, and presets and stuff like that. I think it's great. Um, I was going to ask, um, um, explain the, you, you mentioned that when you, when you, you have a, a template and you have two lead vocal tracks, uh, explain how you, how you came to that. You always use two lead vocal tracks and they're treated exactly the same. And do you ride them together? Do you pair them, the, the channels to, together and tell me how you, you came up with that. They are locked together and they are solely two is better than one. Two is louder than one. They're identical. So they're not doubles. They're actually a clone. Mm -hmm. So I was mixing <clears throat> way back when 
And I always got used to hitting option, at mouse, click on the fader, and in Pro Tools, it snaps it to zero, Unity Game. And I got really comfortable doing that as a starting spot for my individual fades and uh, individual channels. The problem being, it was hitting the two bus too hard. It was redlining and slamming it, distorting. So I kept turning the two bus down and down. And I got so comfortable working with faders louder and a two bus quieter as opposed to a two bus at zero, unity gain, and then mixing into that, that I could never get the vocal above the music. So I read an article, once again, not to reference beat a dead horse, but Chris Ward Aldi was like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. you can either pull everything down or just I take a patch cable, molt it in, put it on another fader, bring it up, it's twice as loud. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I wonder if that will work in Pro Tools. So I did it, and it works if you copy it identical if you duplicate the track and then group them together it literally is twice as loud if you make one plug in uh running off your computer and another one using the dsp chip from avid it will phase so you have to duplicate and make it twice as loud and yes i treat them identical and just group them together and i've been doing it for so long i don't know how to do it any other way mm -hmm. as a matter of fact those uh plugins that joey sturgis made on my vocal plugin there's a one button and a two. And if you hit the two, that's all it does is it makes it twice as loud. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, so with, you're, you're able to mix a song and you say 45 minutes to an hour, right? And you're mixing five songs a day, which is a, just a typical day for you, plus an interview. Uh, so what, what do you do when the songs come in and they need a little extra love? You know what I mean? Uh, or, get, or do they? Are they all tuned? Oh, no, 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 no. Sometimes I get stuff in that needs cleaning up. Uh, you and I were talking earlier. I hope I'm not jumping on your question here, but uh, regarding tuning, a lot of times people will give you something untuned and just expect you to take care of it, where a lot of times on when you get record stuff, all of that's done, all the editing and all the tuning is done beforehand. But say you get an independent project or even a demo. Uh, a lot of times you'll just get the raw tracks. They're not cleaned up or anything. And I'm like, for me, that's fine. Just because I'm used to cleaning up the tracks. I'm used to having to do that. I actually came from the demo world where we had five songs back in, say, 2000. And they would track them in the morning, over them in the afternoon. I would mix them at night and they would have to be done by the next day. And I was doing everything in that process. And... So I got used to just putting auto-tune on or drawing something, and that's how I learned to work so fast. But it started beating me up after a while, so I said, I've got to just, you know, I'm tired of getting up at 7 in the morning and getting home at 11 at night. So mm -hmm. I said, I'm just going to be a mixer. I want to be the quarterback on the football team. So, yeah. And you don't have to be the Tom Brady because there's tons of quarterbacks out there. You know what yeah. I mean? So right. it's it's right. been great. It's fine. You know, if I never – do anything, but what I'm doing right now, I can sail off in the sunset, and it'll be like, good job, good job. I'm happy as can be. Uh, so uh, let's see. You don't have a okay. Let's talk about let's talk about drums for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, in the book, you talk about how you malt the kick track to three different tracks, and you put a different trigger on each track. One's got more snap, one's got more mid range, and one's got more girth. Yes, you do the same thing with a snare. Um, yes. So, uh, and then what I thought was genius, and this is one thing I'm going to, I'm going to do too, since I tend to, Chris Rodalge does, and it sounds like you do too, uh, use the same verb pretty much on everything. You have a verb sample that you trigger also. That's just brilliant. Yeah. It's the Stephen Slate room, uh, 13 a I've lived and died by that thing. And it's, it's probably not the best one that he ever put out, but it was the first one I found that I liked. And so I just kept using it. I, Sounds fine, you know. So it's a room sound from a snare? Yeah, his uh, 13A snare, and that's the reverb, and I think it's the SSDR, and I blend in the actual NRG room that he did too. So it's both mm -hmm. of them blended in. Right. So well, let me, yeah. let If me, it ain't broke, why fix it, you know? He, he sampled yeah, great snare. I I, I I use, what kick, just curious, what kick samples do you use then? Uh, I use... They, I use uh, one for the snap that has no low end. It's just got the tick on it. 
And that I made myself at Soundstage, or actually I didn't make it, uh, an engineer. Uh, he's a studio manager now over at Soundstage, but Nick Autry sent me a session to mix one time that he recorded and this kick was like perfect. So I asked, I, I, well, I don't even know if I asked. Nick, I'm sorry if I didn't ask, but I've made quite a career off your kick drum. Thank you. I'll send you like some of those cookies if I get an endorsement. Uh, so I use that, and then I use another one that I just found that's got kind of this low-end, super good thump, you know, but it's really tight. And then uh, I always put in a dance kick because I've got the tick, I've got the low-end, but there's something missing in like normally where you would scoop out in the like 240, 180, somewhere around there on a real kick to get that push sound. It, there was always a hole and I would listen to like uh, pour some sugar on me or uh, the Brian Adams thing that Mutt Lang did. I always go back to those things, but uh, everything I do, I do for you. That has such a, that whole record has such there's this spot that it fills that most kicks don't fill. And I'm like, wow. And I found it in this dance kick. So I blend those. So I actually use like a dance kick from an EDM pack I found right. a while back. And then the snares are the same thing. I've got the tick. I've got a fatness. And then I've got kind of a ring that livens up uh, all the other samples. Because if you just – I used to just replace 100% and everybody could tell it was so fake, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so now I always blend in the reel and then if a drummer press rolls into a fill or something like that I ride up the reel and then pull him back down and just get the twos and fours from the sample Yeah, so I try to make it sound as realistic as possible with the addition of samples right. you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you I don't think I have mixed a song without samples in 15 years really? no joke. unless somebody says you know what? I'm adamant. No samples at all. Now, obviously, if it's like a jazz thing or something where the guy's on a brush, yeah, and a puffy kick, you know, I'll do that. But mm -hmm. as far as modern country, unless somebody specifically goes, okay, we want this to sound like Chris Stapleton, organic as can be across the board, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not that guy. I can do it, but I'm not going to ever get called to be that guy. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty cool. Um, I was going to ask you, you know, what do you uh, what do you say to drummers or producers that are really proud of their drum sounds, and do you just kind of lean a little bit more toward the the live and still sneak some in there, or I, I say tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I say, how about you play and I'll mix? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, the thing is, is all my samples are real drums that have been sampled, so it's not like other than the 808 or not the 808, the dance kick, you know what I mean? That I blend in yeah. everything else is I've gotten. That is a real kick, you know? So mm -hmm. in essence, another trick you can do is if the drummers are adamant about not replacing, I will actually sample a one-off from their kit from the session and blend that in to fatten up the two and four. Yeah. Then you can put it on another track. EQ it, compress it differently, and you don't have the hi hat bleed and all the right. extraneous noise. So, there's yeah. more than one way to skin a cat. I usually just don't tell them and just mix it. Uh -huh. And if I know they're super purists, I'll just ride the reel up so they can hear that tingy hi hat in the snare, even though I hate right. that sound. I'll purposely put that in. Yeah, sneak in the sample so they don't know. So, just uh, just finding out a little bit more about this. Do you? Uh, so you take. So basically you have four snare. Let's just talk about snare for a second. You have the real track and then you have the three sample tracks, right? Mm -hmm. Or are you using the three samples in one, one instance of like yeah, the, the real right? top, the real bottom, and then three samples. And let me go back to the drummer thing. Uh, any drummer that is a purist, I promise you, if they're a good drummer, they have a sample pack out there. All drummers sell their own samples. Mm -hmm. So, there you go. You can't tell at me if you're out there selling drums. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have a uh, I have a uh, great drummer turned mixer, and you would think that he would be a purist too, but no, he. Uh, He's using he his his favorite. Yeah. You, you know, you talk about uh, one of the things you said in the book. Uh, I love this part right here. You said something about being consistent. Um. Um. 
well, can't find it right now, but you talked about being consistent. And like one of the best ways you can be consistent is know what, you know, what your drums know that first of all, that when they hit the, the snare, it's going to happen and sound the same every time because that doesn't reflect on the drummer as much as it does uh, the mixer most of the time. Right. They're like, why couldn't you get every drum to sound the same? Well, th that's when you turn to samples and kind of tweak it up a little bit. Right. Yeah. And that's also the beauty of being able to do this for as long as I have. I mean, I will put the audio, I'll drag it into my template or whichever template I'm using. I've got tons of them now, but I usually just gravitate towards something that I've, enjoyed recently and that's my newest template you know mm -hmm. but seriously if i drag your audio in if it's not distorted and i drag your audio in it's halfway decent i gain it up the structure that i'm used to i hit play and it's literally 85 percent of the way there mm -hmm. no joke, no joke. and that just comes from doing this for as long as i have and i know how big waveforms need to be. I know how it needs to be balanced and stuff like that. So for better or worse, it's, it's consistent. You may not like what I do, but I tell you what, you cannot argue the consistency, you know? Yeah. So you could say I consistently hate Decker and I'm like, well, okay, it, it's consistent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. Um, uh, yeah. So w there's a couple of things you mentioned in the book about, um, you know, reference mixing, uh, and one thing that kind of struck me and, th and I tend to do this and I, and I'm going to check myself, uh, on page 84, you said, uh, I do little, if any writing of faders. And then you said right after that, have the courage to leave the faders alone. Uh, that's one thing that I do. I mean, I don't ride a lot of faders as far as like, you know, like you do, I ride the fills up a little bit, but mainly I leave everything the same except for vocals. I'm, I'm the guy that you mentioned in the book that says, you know, that you ride up the first, the first syllable of everything, but you let your compressors do most of that. I probably need to lean more toward my compressors. Tell me how you come across, uh, tell me, uh, let's dig into that a little bit about you not riding faders a lot. Yeah. I just, figured out a way I, it's probably no secret sauce or anything like that i'm actually opening up a session right now so i can actually show you my vocal tracks and this will probably shock you let me see if i can get in there can you see those a uh, little bit closer yeah That's okay good. the top two tracks are the verse the bottom two are the chorus, and then there's doubles below that but you can see there's only about two rides per per channel. And all they are is bumped up like a DB on a few spots. But what I've figured out, for better or worse, is I always start with a compressor and slam it super slow, super fast, an 1176, that blue version. And yeah. the only reason I use the blue over the black is because I read that's what Chris Ward Algae does. <laughs> There you go. If it, if it works for him, obviously it's fine for me. Right. But I knock it back about 7 dB, all right? But you don't hear the pumping because the release is super slow. I mean, the, the attack is super slow. The release is super fast. Then I EQ. Uh, then I use that Renaissance vocal. And I don't know what it does. It just does. And I pulled it down one time to minus 17 and it sat perfect in the track. So I turned that into a preset called 17, and it's like, that's gospel for me. So I don't care <laughs> what vocal you give me, it's 17. Right. And then I double DS, so I hit the S's up top for a male, probably 8K, somewhere around there. Females a little higher, 9, 10, sometimes even 11, 12 for the pss, pss, pss. Mm -hmm. But then I DS also, but I drop it all the way down to 2K. So it de-honks it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because you add that much limiting and compression and it's just building up, building up right there. So uh, I like to take out that Trisha Yearwood, Carrie Underwood, butter knife in the forehead thing. You know, that 2K, mm -hmm. thing, it just, it's that real sharp pokey thing, you know? So yeah. and it's, it seems to work. So, and then I just add a little bit of verb, a little bit of delay. And the delay is just that, crappy echo farm plug-in that i still have because i'm still on pro tools 10 so i have yeah. the dsp version of it you know and That's, i don't think they make it for uh, native anymore do they 
Like if you had 11 or 12 or whatever, can you? Uh, I haven't seen it in a while, but yeah. um, I just moved up to 11. Um, I was at 10 too, because I was like, I was like you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, upgrade my system until I have to, because I spent so much money on my control surface and my, you know, and then I finally uh, Dropbox stopped working. And that was, that was a kick. Uh, me. <laughs> well, what's funny is I was on eight all the way up till about, six years ago when I moved over here to the cabin over in Westwood, mm -hmm. I was on eight for the longest time, you know? Well, and then I switched over to 10. I have 11 on my laptop, but I accidentally upgraded my laptop, which is like a 2011 laptop we're talking on right yeah. now. And it stopped working. So it won't import audio. There's a bug in 11 that won't let you with whatever operating system I'm working. So I'm just like, mm -hmm. Oh, well, no big deal. I'll stay on 10. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's respectable. Yeah, I can upgrade yeah. at any time. I've, all my friends are like, dude, are you an idiot? What are you doing? So, uh, Don't Steve, you know there's dark mode now? <laughs> Steven, Steven Slate uh, sent me some plugins and they wouldn't work. So I called them back and they're like, well, yeah, you're on 10. So they actually, he had to go back and ask one of his software guys to build a legacy bridge so I could even use these things. Really? So thank you, Stephen. I'm the only guy that's got the legacy bridge. From <laughs> well, so, hey, uh, Billy, one of the things I wanted to do is uh, uh, I would like to give away this signed copy of my book. Yes. And, uh, and, I, and I don't know of a great way to do this, uh, except maybe do this. Um, not in the live section, but anybody who would like this book, I'm going to let Billy pick the winner, but you have to go into the comment section, not necessarily, well, the comment section, or uh, I don't know about the live, the live chat section. Let's go into the comment section of either Facebook or YouTube, which the, the links are, are right here. And then if you can make a comment, it can be a thumbs up. It can be Billy's uh, signature mayor of, of Deckerville or, or one of these even <laughs> just make a comment in, in one of the sections and Billy's going to go over there later today and randomly pick somebody. And I'm going to ship this book to you. So I'll be, make sure that we uh, make sure that I can get in touch with you on Facebook or whatever. I'll, I'll DM you back or whatever. And we'll, we'll send this out. You can autograph it to the winner. I autographed it to you. So you can autograph it to the winner. How about that? Okay, I, that sounds good. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure I may. I may take the value down a little bit, but still, it's free. So, so make some comments. Remember to make the comments in the uh, in the uh, description section, not not the live chat. We're going to be picking from the description section. So, uh, I'll uh, anytime. Let's let's just do it tomorrow. We'll pick it out tomorrow, and I'll ship it out. Okay. Perfect. I actually had a a quick side note. I had a friend of mine who is allergic to ink, like book ink. Anytime he buys a book, paperback, or a newspaper, it gives him a headache after about 10 minutes. I don't know if it's like some kind of allergic reaction or something, but he called me and he goes, your book doesn't give me a headache. I don't know why, but it doesn't give me a headache. So this is apparently eco-friendly, hypoallergenic ink used in this book. It's a hypoallergenic book. Now it, it, it is flammable, so you can start a fire. Read it one time, then it's like kindling. You know what I mean? It yeah. will blow up pretty good. Hey, uh, rewind just a second. Uh, we talked about drum samples. Uh -huh. You have a sample pack, too. Are the samples that you use in your mix in your sample pack? Yes, and they are the three blended into one pre-processed. So all you got to do is put one of those on one fader, and it substitutes all three. Now, granted, there might be a little... Because you're having three hitting a bus, it's a little different gain structure wise, but you really only need to use just the one, you know? Right. So if you want, put the one in and then duplicate it. And that two of those probably will be about the same volume and everything as the three that okay. I normally use. Okay. Now right. what about your what about your plugins? Uh, and and I say this, I haven't bought your plugins yet, but I, I guarantee you by the oh, end of the day, I'm gonna give I'm going to give it a try there. Um, but I, I have a lot of friends that I respect and their plugins live in their mix templates. So your, uh, your, uh, 
uh, vocal processing, acoustic guitar. Uh, I even had one guy, uh, I think it was Matt Butler and, um, and, uh, um, Matt Butler and Chris Crunk were telling me that your, uh, you, I, I'm, I'm, I may be missing this up a little bit. I don't want to mislead people, but they use your piano plugin on vocals or your vocal plugin on piano. And they said it's the magic. That's funny. That's yeah. Funny. So are you using your plugins on your template or yeah. you kind of use them here and there or? No, the, the plugins actually were built from this book. The book was first and then the plugins were after. That's why the plugins aren't in the book, but they are those exact channels. Oh. using Joey's code. So it emulates like an 1176. His code is a, an emulation of that 1176. And then it goes into an EQ. Uh, and then it does some kind of a limiting magic, like the Renaissance vocal, you know? So nice. that's how you, that came about. Uh, but they're identical as far as what is in the book is the building blocks for the plug. Right, yeah. right. If that makes uh, sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. And it makes uh, it makes total sense that you didn't mention it, but because the plugins came after the fact, I totally get that. Yeah. Just wondered if, it, if, uh, if, you know, sometimes I wonder if Chris Lord Algae uses his own, uh, his own like one stop, one button sort of thing. So I bet, um, he does. I bet he does. It's pretty fun to have your own. So, I mean, you got to use it once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll check it out. Well, Hey, uh, let's go uh, to the live chat here. Let's take some questions. I, sure. I remember I was telling a friend of mine, uh, Dan, that I was going to interview you and he said, find out what he, and I know you, you mentioned this in the book. You mm -hmm. said, I'm going to let you figure out your own verbs, but I'm curious what, what are your go-to verbs for vocals? Uh, right now I have that same session up and I'm using the waves Renaissance R verb and it's on vocal play and it's 2.95 is the time. So it's a preset with 2.95 as a reverb. Just go to plates and hit vocal plates. And it's like, that's it. Nothing. Right. Special. I figured if somebody better than me figured out what's the best verb to use. Why? Why would I, you know, just click on vocal plate. It's all. I good. don't have any problems using presets. So to wow. me, it's like, you know, I always tell uh, my guys that I, you know, kind of tutor with mixing and stuff on Mix Coach. Um, you only have so much brain processing power in a mix. You only have so much of an intention span. And mm -hmm. if you're going to spend all your time trying to figure out the perfect uh, kick sample or the perfect snare sample or the perfect verb, then you've kind of wasted that that money on that when you could have been, you know, listening critically to the mix again. Yeah. The, uh, only, the only thing I ever figured out on my own was on my bass track. Uh, if I get a bass that's real unruly and you got to lock it in, I always remembered uh, Mike and Mike Shipley's mixes. And he always used that. Is it star level, stay level? How do you say it? S T A stay level. Yeah. Stay level. Okay. Stay level. So I could never find the parameters because it's a fixed attack and release. I think it was just like two knobs, you know? And so I ended up calling a tech buddy of mine and he went down the rabbit hole and got a manual from it and found the attack and the release times. And I mimicked that using a, a McDSP plugin. And that's, and then I called it stay level or stay put. I called it stay put. <laughs> like stay still, stay still. Lock it. <laughs> And so that that's the closest I've ever come to using my own brain power to solve a problem, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, we got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, guys, if I miss the questions, be sure and ask them again at the bottom because I can only scroll so far back up to the top. But uh, let's see. Uh, Robert Dewey Atkins says, I'm curious about uh, exactly what type of compression uh, does the acoustic plug-in model or is it a secret? I don't think there's any secrets here, are there? There's no secrets. I, I stole it from somebody else. So why not? Uh, the only thing unique about that is normally in recording school or in all the books, you're supposed to compress first, then EQ, and then blah, blah, blah. So on the acoustic plug-in, I EQ first, then it's an 1176, black, not the blue, uh, and then uh, like a, a limiter after that, you know, some type of an L2 or equivalent. You know, mm -hmm. so that's the the modeling chain. The EQ is actually first in the acoustic. So if it sounds good, 
maybe or a little different perhaps mm -hmm. maybe that's why because it's not typically where you smash it first then eq it it's eq'd first then smash mm -hmm. got it that so makes sense. the 1176 is it kind of a kind of a preset approach or how much are you how much are you kissing it there 6 db or uh usually about three or four db and it's super slow super fast i'm a super slow super fast all the way <laughs> slow all the way fast attack yeah, so super slow attack super yeah. fast release got yeah. it so it doesn't pump and it leaves oh, yeah. a lot of those transients to come through so you don't have to ride the faders right yeah and the only time is uh the plug-in might not work is if it's a real bright or a real ticky like you can hear a lot of that pick attack mm -hmm. you want to kill some of that remake the channel by putting an eq an 1176 and then a limiter and on the 1176 speed up that attack so it knocks off the got it you know that would be got the it. only time where my plug-in probably wouldn't work because the attack's too slow in the preset right. you know right just so, uh, yeah uh, okay my buddy joel here hill says what deessers do you like i know you use two on a vocal channel what are your go-to's uh the wave the old waves ones the gray ones yeah uh that just says deesser yeah so That's and i know the newer and probably better ones but i i've got almost every plugin out there but i never even use any of them you know what i mean yeah. I use the same stuff i've been using i don't even know why i buy plugins anymore <laughs> <laughs> i just use the same old ones you know well, you got to have another book. You got to you got to have the template mixing version two. Yeah, Billy, by the way, Billy grows uh, up version two. Billy bought plugins. Another cool thing about this book, Billy, I'm sure you know about this, is that every uh, every plugin on every channel is detailed right down to what the fader level is. So, if you guys want to build a template like Billy's mixing with, pick up the book. It's uh, it's definitely worth the price of admission. Um, see, so the DS we've got that, uh, Dr. McFarlane, Nathan says your favorite song you've ever mixed. Uh, bah, 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 bah. probably the first number one I ever mixed that has to be my favorite. And it was a song called brand new girlfriend by Steve Holy in 2005 or six, I think. Yeah. Hey, somebody paste that, uh, somebody find that on YouTube and paste it into this comment section so we can see it. Uh, I would, but I've got some more questions I want to ask Billy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And you know what's funny about that song is that was before delay compensation was even a thing. So, I mean, I'm using samples and they're out of phase and everything. You put it in mono, it's like... Really? A wah-wah pedal, you know? So, wow. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It was a good song. People liked it. So, there you go. Yeah, a good song and a good singer. Yeah. Recorded well, it will make the mix a lot easier to do, right? Exactly. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, 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 Biek, um, sorry, I'm probably uh, butchering your name. I know you told me this on the other live broadcast, what your name was, but he wants to know do you use w just one reverb on mixes? I, I guess, I guess he, uh, I know you, I know you use more than one reverb, you use one for vocals, one for instruments. instruments. And then one for drums, if the room samples, if if I need a bigger drum sound. So if mm -hmm. if not, the room samples always suffice. But if I do need a bigger drum sound, like the big cavern, then it's actually <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this. Uh, it's the the stock Dever plugin. I love the stock Dever plugin. That's it. Yeah, and I just put it on like ambient. Or and this one's got ambient, uh, or sometimes I use like hall if it needs to be like a concert stadium, you know. Yeah. A lot of times I've got actually I've got samples that are bigger room sounds that I'll put in. Like if you need it to be like we will rock you or something like that, you know, the stomps and the claps. Yeah. I won't even use a real verb. I'll use a sample of a bigger room. <sighs> That's smart. Yeah, and it's just easier to control. Plus, you can go into trigger and you can manipulate the decay and the how yeah. fast. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool to do That's that. All right, man. Uh, and you can do the. Uh, I think you can do. You can delay it like pre-delay too, right? Uh, now that I don't know, but I do know 
that the secret to a clean mix, and I got this from the horse's mouth, was to get the actual, like if you're doing do do ka, do do ka, the ka has to stop before the next one hits. You know what I mean? Okay. You just put a huge verb on that's like five seconds. It's just going to keep falling all over itself. Keep building up. Get the decay out before the next one hits. So it's like gun gun ka, gun gun ka, you know, and it yeah, gets has, out before the next one hits. Yeah, it has to land before the downbeat, I guess, yes, right? Yes, yes. That's cool. And that keeps it clean. Okay, here's another question, a longer one. But uh, Jeff Smith says that he loves the book. He's just created his template. And he says, and, and I this is a great question. Uh, you visually set the clip gain. This is a really cool thing. You actually look at the waveform and you clip gain it so that it hits the first, um, it hits the first plug in like it should. And a crystal algae does the same thing. Uh, and he says he's having a little trouble and he'd like to know how much gain reduction are you looking for on the compression in general? All right. Look at the top. Can you see that waveform right there? Let me uh, move right there. Yeah. Okay. That's on medium waveform, and there's a quarter inch dead space above and a quarter inch dead space below. And in Pro Tools, when you set your fader view on the medium waveform, leave a quarter inch at the top of dead space and below, and that, that hits it perfectly for the template. And that's all the tracks. I always yeah. leave about a quarter inch, put it on medium, and then – Leave a quarter inch top, quarter inch at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and I can understand how that would work with your workflow because you already have the compressor set up. Correct. But was there a, is there, a, like I know on 1176, it seems like the sweet spot is between five and seven dB. Like when you, when you hit that 1176 and it sounds magic when Correct. you hit that, is that kind of what you're looking for to begin with? And you, you set everything and then that way you visually can just put it in there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got all that stuff in the book that's set for the waveform. If it's a certain height, it'll hit that sweet spot. So right. Just a quarter okay. inch top, quarter inch at bottom, that'll get you out of trouble anytime, at least for the book. Yeah. The gain structure set. So, so Jeff, if uh, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, paste them down below, um, and we'll, we'll keep on going. Uh, Gregory Price says, do you master the tracks you send to clients? This is in the book, too, but go ahead and cover this. Yes, I uh, I include an unmastered version and a mastered version, and the only I mix into the two bus. So if you take off, start taking the limiting and stuff off, it sounds different, you know. So I always follow everything up with either an L three at the end of the chain. So we'll start with an EQ, uh, and then the Kramer Pi three to one, super fast attack. Uh, super fast release the attacks preset knock it back a couple db uh and then the oxford inflator and then uh, a limiter and then if you want to send something off to mastering to be mastered out off site i'll just turn the uh the limiter off you know what i mean mm -hmm. otherwise i put the limiter on and i usually use i've been using that ozone maximizer lately mm -hmm. and I use the second irc whatever that means there's four of them mm -hmm. I use that and then i put the transient about halfway through the transient response and then just knock it back a couple db and yeah. i can usually get stuff to uh about minus five minus four so i love mixing loud you know i just came yeah. in the school of thought louder is better whether yeah. or not it's true or false it, it is you it, take you take two you take two mixes that are identical yeah. and you bump one up by a couple of DB and people are going to choose that one every time. So now we did find, I just did something for uh, Rodney Atkins and we sent it to, it went, it got mastered and he wanted it super loud. And when it showed up on Spotify and Apple music, we sent it to him like minus five, minus six and it was pushing it down and it actually was quieter than everybody else. So we did some figuring out and we made a few calls. Spotify and Apple like to get their stuff at minus eight, minus eight and a half. And that keeps their algorithm from pushing it down or pushing it up. So right. minus eight, if you send something off to a streaming service, mm -hmm. minus eight will keep you from getting manipulated by their stuff. 
That's gold, man. Yeah, yeah. And we found that out the hard way. And we actually had to go back, loosen it up on our end, and then Curb had to resubmit it. And this just happened probably six months ago. So it's okay. still so fresh. When you just to clarify, when you say minus five, minus six, minus eight, you're talking about luffs, right? Uh whatever, what is it? Minus I don't know a whole lot of so, so your your average level is is minus five. Your peak yes. is it? Yeah. Uh, RMS. 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 Yeah. Yes. Which to me, I mean, maybe I don't understand everything, but I'm finding that Luffs is kind of a, like a, I think waves makes a plugin that shows Luffs and, and, you know, you and I came from the old school of mixing on analog and uh, where you did, where you let the analog tape kind of make up the difference between what was peak and what was RMS, because as long as you got the, the uh, VU meter up to zero, you were good. And it sounded loud as everybody else's, right? <laughs> and now it seems like there's so much dynamic range that people miss that a lot. I don't miss analog at all. The only thing I do miss is flipping the tape upside down and recording backwards. Yeah. You know, that was fun. And the smell of it when it was rewinding, right? And the stuff all over your hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, hey, uh, what was the name of the song? Your, your favorite song again? Oh, uh, Brand New Girlfriend. Brand New Girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Danny. But if, uh, if you want to hear something with this template in action, I just got a new one that just hit the uh, that just hit radio. I think last week it's the kid's name is Andrew Janakos. He's on Sony. And I use the template. He's got a song called Gone Too Soon. It just went for ads. And uh, so that's the latest thing on the radio or about to be on the radio that I've used the template on. So, And that's more of a – it's got some programming and stuff in it. And uh -huh. the template still works with the programming stuff. So it might be kind of fun just to listen to something that's maybe not right. straight down the road, you know? Right. I, I just like pulled it. Now where it's actually working, you know? Right, I'm I'm pulling these up now. Uh, I will, I'll paste the. This is the uh, I think the brand new girlfriend I'm going to paste here in the in the uh, comments. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if that it would be the link of the video or whatever. But anyway, there's that one. And then uh, gone too soon. Yeah, that's brand new, but you can find it. It just came out. Got it. I'm I'm actually I found it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pop it in the comment section. That way, uh, this will be. An all-inclusive. Uh, there we go. Okay, so the, both of those songs are in the link, guys, or in the uh, live chat section. Uh, let's see. Um, I think we covered the left plug in there. You uh, use a yaw spiral. I know. Okay. Yeah. Luff sounds like a, a diaper brand. I think <laughs> they say RMS or Loves Luffs Luffs. Yeah. <laughs> Do you use Luffs? No, we're gonna no. say RMS from now on. I use German. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool okay so the questions are kind of uh, dying down a little bit i'm going to dive right back in just for, just for another second uh we've got maybe five or ten more minutes and um i'm going to look back on my notes um ref uh you said uh what are some of the mixes that you reference um i'm, I'm i asked that because there was a Okay. Um, Stuff I like to reference is when I hear something and I go, oh, wow, how did they do that? I wonder if I could do that. And yeah. then I actually try to mimic it. You know what I mean? I'll put it up side by side with something I'm doing and I see do if that. I can mimic it. So right. I still, that, that probably is what keeps me coming back to work every day still and makes me realize I've got like the greatest job in the world, like a paid hobby. It's when you hear something and you go, Oh wow! I wonder how they did that. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure that out is is half the fun of my day these days. Yeah, you know. You mentioned too, and, I, and I'm I'm wondering if you do this with the uh, Isotope plugin. You said that you will take um, um, another mix that you're referencing, and you'll take the EQ curve and steal it, put it on yours, and then this is the this is the thing that that shows I think maturity is like. Does it sound better? If it doesn't, turn it back off. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you use that with ozone? Yeah, it's fun to see other people and what what their curve looks like, you know, as opposed to mine. And then I'll put it on both mixes side by side and go back and forth and go, oh yeah, he's got like a bump at 
500, which normally I would carve out, you know, I'm like, Oh, that's my problem. I need to maybe put something in that space that I, mm-hmm. I never have before. And it'll sound maybe similar, but okay. I have found no matter what you do, you can never copy somebody identical. No. You know, I've tried before. And that was one of the things when we were doing the book and I've done some video courses and stuff like that. And everybody's like, then you're giving away everything. People can copy you. Before I did any of this, I called like three of my good mixing buddies. I gave them the exact template, the exact song, all my samples down to the last, you name it. And I said, do me a favor, try to mimic me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it started out like this. And then all of a sudden, one guy's ears naturally led him this way. The other guy was going this way. By the time they were done, it was like that far apart. It wasn't even close. Right. It's because everybody has their own set of ears. Here's right. your plugins right there, you know? Yeah. And always gravitate towards what you like. And so that everybody's like, oh, job security, you're putting yourself out of business. I'm like, no, trust me. No, I find I find that the guys who are, are the best are actually usually uh, the most, um, they share the most stuff. Like, oh. uh, uh, let me let me rewind. You were talking about mimicking stuff. I remember in ninety when I first got to town, I listened and, and was influenced by the the Chris Hordalgy stuff that he did that she that he did for uh, Tim McGraw, like you mentioned. Jody Messina that heads t- Carolina Tales California was a big reference of mine that I used a lot. One time I was trying to mimic his snare sound and. And I just like put his stuff in a loop and I put mine in a loop and I was going to try everything I possibly could to make my snare sound like that snare on Heads Carolina, Tails California. Um, and what I found was the same thing you did. You were talking about the mid range. I found that if I pulled one K almost completely out of the snare, it was that sound. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I've been using that ever since, you know, the other thing I found about that snare sound was it was Lonnie Wilson playing the drums and it was his snare. He used that same snare on everything and the way he hits it. uh, I've actually been in the studio and had an assistant hit his drum kit to get sounds before he shows up in the sound. He shows up and all of a sudden there's this ring in it. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, where'd that come from? And he just goes right here. (laughs) So that snare is Lonnie Wilson from those days. And It uh, he shared it with me since then, and so he's helped me kind of down that path. But that just goes to show you that even if you have the same stuff, same drum kit, you're not Lonnie Wilson. You got right. the same plugins, but you're not Mike Shipley. You're not Chris Lord Algae. You know? Yeah, so. you, you know, uh, there's a few more questions that come in, but I was uh, I try to put a puzzle together uh, in December, usually the week between Christmas and new year's, just to kind of like what you do when you build your decor boards, Mm -hmm. you know, I've always, uh, heard and say that when you use your ears and your brain to work, you should use your hands, um, uh, to kind of relax. Um, and one of the things I do is put a puzzle together. And I always, uh, you said you're one of the last guys in Nashville on another podcast that still cuts your own grass. (laughs) Uh, And, and that's one of those things where you do a lot of thinking. Okay. So, now that that's said, one of the things I discovered when I was putting this puzzle together is like, you know, if I wanted to be an egomaniac, I could put this puzzle together without looking at the reference, without looking at the the picture of the puzzle that's on the cover. But why? It would be so much harder to do. Why not look at the reference and then put, put the puzzle together? And And I think what you're saying is the same thing I agree with, too, is like, you know, copy people that that you like their mixes try to copy them because you're not going to nail it and you're going to learn several things along the way that's going to make you a better mixer and nobody's going to nobody's going to say hey that's the same way billy decker eqs his kick i'm i'm suspicious of your skills now so anyway i just wanted to mention that uh just for the grass reference my neighbor does have better grass than me so i look next door to see what he's doing i got moles coming out my yin yang i cannot rid of these moles in my yard so hit them with a decker board if anybody has mole suggestions please please type in that'll help you win the book too <laughs> <laughs> hey uh a couple more questions here can you please ask billy do you use different verb on ballads than rock song what's the difference in the approach on the parameters like decay no what do you look for in vocal verb i just make it longer 
So on a ballad, I'll just make it longer and maybe use more of it. But no, I, I almost keep it the same, that 2.95 uh, second release, and it's just the vocal plate. Mm. On up-tempo songs, I'll bring it down volume-wise so it, it doesn't spit as much. And on ballads, I'll push it up a bit. But I actually use more delay than verb. And I got that suggestion from a, a friend of mine named Kevin Churko, who's one of my heroes too, you know? So he's a, he's a great rock mixer producer. And he's always like, man, I use way more delays than verbs, you know? Yeah. So I've, I've done that. And delays seem a little cleaner. It just allows you to get that vocal bore up in your face. Right. Uh, unless you're going for that big washy thing, you know, then you can, obviously you're going to need some verb, you know? Wow. There's a lot of questions that have come in. Uh, let's, let's do some of these, uh, let's, some of these quick. We don't have to elaborate on these. Sure. Um, I can go through them fast. With an exception of maybe this first one. Uh, how do you obtain clarity in your mix? You uh, do the bus, right? Yeah. What I do is mixing is like painting a picture. All right. So I, my job is to keep it within the frame. All right. Left and right is panning, up and down is volume, back and forth is reverbs, delays, choruses. That's your 3D. Now, mm -hmm. when you're painting, if you cover up something, you're not going to see it. So you need to pan it and get it off there. Or you need to raise it up or you need to bring it back in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So think of it as painting. You know, you're looking at a picture and treat it like that. Mm -hmm. That's cool. What monitors do you like? I've got uh, my Mackie. 824, I think the the newer versions and my little Wathen Audio speakers from uh, Wathen Audio. I think they're down in Texas. And then my boombox. All right. And then uh, earbuds. You use those too. And your car. Uh, yeah, I usually don't reference on earbuds because to me, everything sounds the same on earbuds. I can't tell a difference. Right. So right. I'll listen to something and go, man, that sounds awesome. And then I get in the studio and listen to it. And I'm like, no, that sounds like garbage. Yeah, the earbuds in the car are pretty much to kind of make sure that you didn't overlook something and right. you know, low end, right? Yeah. Uh, so, do you parallel compress vocals? No. Uh, I do on backgrounds. I parallel compress backgrounds sometimes, not all the time. And when I parallel compress, I will send uh, everything to the vocal sub, but if I need them to cut through without getting pinched, uh, I will send them to straight to the two bus as well. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Mark Jacoby uh, says, do you limit the styles of music that you mix? I know you like metal too, right? Uh, you love metal. Yes. Uh, no, I mixed uh, a Russian EDM thing that just showed up in my inbox and they PayPal me uh, like a dance band in Russia. Uh, I've done some Latin stuff. Uh, I've done orchestral stuff, a bunch of movie soundtrack stuff. 95% country just because where I'm located here in Nashville, you know. But no, I, I'm that guy that never says no because I just enjoy doing what I do and somebody's going to mix it. It might as well be me, you know. Yeah. Well. Plus, it... it by me doing as much as I do, it keeps me in practice. It's almost like anything. You have to be in practice. So say, for instance, I do get the latest, greatest, biggest artist next week. I'm in practice. My ears are healthy. If I go on vacation uh, and I'm away from it for a week, it takes me a couple days to get back into it, you know? Yeah. So I really do think being in practice helps for when you do get something that's really going to hit the waves and a lot of people will hear and it brings you more work, you don't struggle with it, you know? Right. Right. Uh, okay. Just a few more, just a few more quick questions. Then we're going to wrap up. Cause I know you got to get, you might find, you've got five songs to mix today. So I'm not going to hold you up. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'll finish in time. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Somebody just listened to brand new girlfriend. Great mix. They love it. Uh, two quick questions. Are those real drums or samples? Uh, the kick is 100% sampled. The snare is blended. That ring from the brand new girlfriend, that was the real snare ringing okay. through. So it's run about half volume. I did not master that. That was Andrew Mendelson at Georgetown Music. Okay, great. Uh, let me ask you a quick question. Then, uh, Do you use several different mastering engineers or do you like to stick with, with a handful of guys that you trust? 90% of the time, the producer gets to choose that or the record company. Uh, I've been using, if anybody asks my opinion, how about that? I'll say 
uh, Nashville, go to Andrew Mendelson at Georgetown or Jim Domain at Yes Master. Okay. Uh, if you want to go something else, uh, a friend of mine, uh, oh, I just forgot his name. He's going to kill me. All right. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. go um, to him. Uh, you might want to reference uh, this oh. thing later on. Somebody's got you a mole removal tool there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, real quick question. How do you get your music to your boom box? You just have uh, a. I actually have, uh, I've got an old school pro control. They don't even make any more. And I have the headphone jack hardwired to the boom box. And you can see the, the purple cord running. <laughs> That's how ghetto we do it. And <laughs> for fun, those pro controls break quite often. So here's my ISO booth. And you can see I've got two other pro controls ready to go with oh, one. Good. You probably get those for a song these days, right? Oh, geez. They're like 300 bucks at yeah. most. You know? I've got a Control 24 that uh, I'm not using anymore right now, too. But I've just become really accustomed to this Argosy desk. I've been sitting behind an Argosy with the Pro Control since 2001. So to me, it's the perfect height for my ears. The, uh, the tweeters shoot over my head the way I keep my chair positioned so it doesn't fatigue me. So that's how I can mix so ah. much. So if you're sitting in front of the tweeters all day long, you're going to just burn out quick. Yeah. So I purposely have them shooting over my head. And it, it's, yeah. you know, let me last longer. You know? Oh, that's cool. Um, let's see. There's a book cover basics on creating templates. I'm big on the specifics and basics. It sets the direction and I came in late. Uh, yes, Dennis, uh, it covers every detail. Um, uh, there's uh, pages and pages of even there's a, even an addendum at the end that tells you, tells you exactly which plugins he uses because he's a little bit more general in the uh, in the book section of it. But he does tell you what he puts and in what order. And then there's a number by the plugin that references to what he's using. And I'm and I'm sure that you experiment with stuff every now and then. But um, um, I don't know. You want to see how. Uh Famous and important I am. Yeah, let's see it. My damn doorknob broke. I had to jimmy my way into the uh, control room. So I'm in the process <laughs> of putting a new doorknob on. That's what you do when you've really hit the big time. Yeah, when you've mixed enough number ones. You get to put your own doorknob on. <laughs> That's hilarious. Man. Hey, we're going to run out of time for these questions, guys. Uh, these these are some good good questions here. But hey, uh, Billy, man, this has been a blast. Let's uh, let's try to do this again sometime, or or when the next time I'm uh, I'm downtown, I may holler at you. Perfect. We'll go grab some hot chicken and maybe a cold one. You know, uh, that sounds great. Hot chicken. You know, I didn't know there was a such thing as Nashville hot chicken. There was no hot chicken in Nashville for the longest time. I, I don't know where that came from, but where do you go, Hattie B's? Yeah. That's just up the street. The best is Prince's, though. I'll, I'll make the drive to Prince's. That's the original, the best. Okay. Well, uh, consider I'm also really excited because uh, Nashville just got their first Taco John's, which is a Midwestern fast food kind of a competitor yeah. to Taco Bell. Yeah. White House. So probably every two weeks I'll drive about a half an hour just to sit in a truck stop it's in a truck stop and eat tacos <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a it sounds like a good use of uh of a, of a lunch hour man life is good life is yeah. good all right so billy man uh thanks for thanks for hanging out today uh i'll let you get to work uh it's been a blast and i really do want to do this again sometime if that's cool with you perfect well thank you for having me on the show and i oh, man. Everybody. It's been fun. Uh, once again, guys, uh, let me go over here just really quick before we, we go. Here is a link uh, to Billy's book. Uh, it's not a, an affiliate link or anything like that. It's just a, a way to make it easier. If you go to Decker Book, I checked it this morning. It was working. Let me know if it doesn't. It should send you to Amazon where you can get the, um, where you can get the uh, Kindle version if you're allergic to ink or you don't, even if you are allergic to ink, it's a, uh, Billy's book is non- uh, What'd you call it? Uh, hypoallergenic. Hypoallergenic. That's right. And it is 
it is guaranteed to improve your mixes. Can uh, I just say thank you to my co-writer, Simon Taylor, over in the United Kingdom for making all this happen. It wouldn't happen without him. So. Yeah, uh, Simon's a cool dude. I, I would love to to chat with him about it, too, about the okay. book. So. He's, he's the real one. So I don't, he, he has no idea what hot chicken is, but. And he's got a funny accent, but he'd be a good guest. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll holler at him and I'll, I'll get him on. But Billy, I'll let you get back to mixing. Thanks thanks for coming today and I'll I'll be in touch, okay? See you soon. See you, bud. All right. So uh, that was a blast. Uh, thank you guys for being so uh, active, asking some great questions. Uh, I just want to remind you one more time before we go. Uh, I have a workshop. If you want to know some uh, some mixing tricks, uh, some mindset, some hacks. These are my fa five favorite hacks of mixing, and you can find it at um, mixcoach.com forward slash workshop. Uh, there's one happening really soon, so jump on there and uh, and check it out. It's completely free, and it's guaranteed to uh, uh, to give you something that you can can go on and improve your mix a little bit even today. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you guys for the great questions. Thank you again, Billy, for uh, for coming, and I look forward to the hot chicken sometime soon. Uh, and, uh, that's it for today. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, share this video. If you found something useful, like it, subscribe to the mix coach YouTube channel, uh, or like the uh, Facebook page and I would appreciate it. Okay. More of these coming up soon and, uh, had a fun, I've had a fun time. Thank you guys for, uh, for coming. All right. Bye.